G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Yes, another big big weekend of AFL football, but another silent weekend of local football unfortunately, which is obviously a massive shame. Still in lockdown and we're... Um we're starting to wonder whether the season will continue at all. Um, very upsetting. The mighty Banyol Bears on track for a premiership in the ones and a grand final in the twos. So disappointing stuff, but at least we've still got AFL to look forward to. Well, hopefully they can do some sort of rejigging because I know in Geelong they've sort of skipped straight to finals and doing it that way. So potentially, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, they can do something like that because I was looking forward to coming up to a big Saturday Arvo watching the double header between uh, y- you running out at 12 and then the uh, the ones at two. So um, Would have been one of the all-time days. But then there's, you know, there's the challenge of keeping fit as well. Which, oh, um, yes, yes, yes. And if anyone can go for a run... Uh, anyone can do a few push-ups, but to stay footy fit um, after a few weeks off is a near impossibility. After the first, lo- the last lockdown, the little two, three-week snapper, we came back <laughs> and everyone was just doing the doing cramp calves in the uh, <laughs> ca- calf cramps rather in the uh, in the third quarter. So we'll see how we go, but uh, at least we've got AFL footy to look forward to, which leads us into our headline for Doss and Rog Daily this week. Uh, green machine. <laughs> Not too many bells or whistles to the to the headline this week, mate. But he's an absolute superstar, probably the most watchable player in the league, and uh, he's found himself in a little bit of hot water. Probably unfair once again. How did you read the great Toby Green's game, McDonald? It's quite funny. Um, a couple of years ago, in that in that All Star game. He had an absolute blinder, and that's when it sort of twigged to me how good Toby Green was. He kicked four in the All-Star game, probably should have got best on ground uh, in the bushfire relief game is the one that I'm talking about. Probably should have got best on ground, but Dusty did. But that's when I started to watch Toby Green in a different light. And then from then, he is amazing down forward. He is, like, every time the ball went near him on Friday night, he was just a different player. Uh, a different level to all the players around him. Like, it, it would come in quite rushed, it would come in quite fumbly, but he would get the ball and steady, um, pick the right option or kick the goal. He is just enormous for that footy club, and he single-handedly got him over the line. Yeah, four goals against arguably, not my opinion, but arguably the best team in the competition to cause quite possibly the upset of the season. And they hadn't, you know, half their list there. I think uh, Josh Kelly got withdrawn before the game started. They had six and changes, I think. How many teams win on the back of six changes? It wouldn't be many. And we know Richmond did it this week against North Melbourne as well. So there's two in the one week. But, uh, yeah, unbelievable form from him to drag that side over the line. And that's probably – he needs to be captain next year. I think we can all agree. Sorry, Cogsy. Um, But, yeah, there's no no better side in footy than when a leader – Purely drags his side over the line. I was, I've been lucky to see Judd do it a few times, and I've been lucky to see Cripper do it a few times in 2019. And it was absolutely a sight to behold. But he has landed himself uh, in two weeks worth of trouble. But it is going to the tribunal. Uh, what did you make of the incident, mate? Do you think there's two sets of laws, one for everyone and one for Toby Green? <laughs> Bit of Toby Green tax on it, I thought. Yeah, um, yeah look, it was <laughs> Dangerfield flies in. Toby Green's coming up, and obviously he's put it. He's uh, he's tried to extend the forearm to get the protection, and it was similar to what Bailey Fritch did. Bailey Fritch was really clumsy at the start of the year, put the arm in. Um, Tom Power gets pushed in from Christopher Petrarca. Bailey Fritch copped a week, but we got it down to nothing because um, Tom Power was fine. He wasn't hurt. I think the only thing that's hanging over Toby is Paddy Dangerfield went to hospital. Um, he's fine though. I'm pretty sure that he's going to play. Uh, next week so obviously if you go to hospital there's a little bit of concern but I believe he is fit Um, yeah for me it it, it wasn't as bad as what people are saying it is and I think he should be able to get off yeah I agree I think um, people are commentating it as if it's a striking action but I don't see it like that at all I think it's a defensive action it's a football action When you've got an absolute bull, a man that most people would be very afraid of getting tackled by, Patrick Dangerfield, running at your full steam ahead, you've got the ball in your hands. Your option is to just submit and cop 
getting tackled by this brute or stick your sort of elbow slash forearm up into the chest and try and defend yourself and push back. And Dangerfield slipped over, resulting in the elbow going high and um, getting him in the jaw. So especially when you look at some of the other incidents that got off this year, you know, Buddy Franklin yeah. um, throwing the elbow back, which wasn't a footy action, more deliberate, um, probably a bigger chance of doing injury. And it wasn't to defend himself. It was an aggressive action. Um, I th- and he got off with just a fine. I think I'll be very, very, very surprised if Toby Green cops his suspension uh, this week. But, you know, some of the most respected commentators in the game, like your Jason Dunstalls, think he, he has to get suspended. So we'll, well wait and what see. Did you, what did you think about the Joel Selwood incident? Because that was one that got me, like, verbally and physically <laughs> up out of my chair. When I saw Joel Selwood run over the football and hit... Sam Taylor high. I know that Sam Taylor bobbed straight back up, but that action we haven't seen for a little while. The players are quite good at either getting to the ball first or if they're not going to get there first, they sort of take a couple steps, a couple slower steps, so they're tackling straight away. So it's sort of like the opposition player gets it and then within a split second they get wrapped up because the timing and uh, yeah, the, the skill of the players to tackle now is so high. So... I hadn't seen an old school run over the ball and run through a bloke. I thought Did he get suspended for that? He got nothing. No, he got a fine. Unbelievable. Yeah, I so can't believe that. So I saw on Fox Footy that um, I can't remember who said it. I wish I could uh, quote them. But they said uh, from that night, it felt like Toby should have probably got a fine and Joel Sowood maybe a week. But it was sort of reversed. I thought watching that live straight away. I thought weeks. I thought I. Th- I didn't even think it would be a question. I thought if he chose to bump, which he did, um, he wasn't going for the ball, and he got him ho- head high contact. I don't know whether it was the same incident. It could be completely unrelated. But Sam Taylor ended up with a black eye at the end of the game. Mm. Don't know if it was from that, but yeah, he chose to bump. He got him high, and just because he didn't get injured. I think shouldn't ma- shouldn't mean it's a fine and no suspension because that means you're given the green light. You're saying yeah. you are allowed to run over the ball, tuck the shoulder in and get someone square in the head. It wasn't even one of those ones where, oh, you know, the main part of his body made contact with his torso, but the point of the shoulder got the head. Mm. It was the only thing he made impact with was his scone. <laughs> yeah. So how could it possibly not be a suspension? That is bizarre to me. But the MRO and uh, and the judicial system has been <laughs> puzzling all year, so I can't say I'm surprised in that respect. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised at all. Um, yeah, I think he's just a little bit lucky, Joel Selwood. I think he, he does play on the line, and that's what we love about him. He's such a fearless, competitive leader, but... Um, yeah, 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 going into finals, there's only a couple of weeks left. I think you're fighting with fire with those sort of incidents. Yeah, well, it looks like Giants have wrapped up, um, or, ju- or you know, given this season, they'll probably lose their next two games out of nowhere. But <laughs> barring catastrophe, it looks like they've wrapped up a spot in the top eight. Good on them. It's, they're starting to prove that they probably are the side that is most deserving of that <laughs> spot, especially if they do get players back towards the tail end and uh, they could maybe do a little bit of damage at the start of finals. But unfortunately, one team that had the same opportunity to stick their hand up for a top eight spot, uh, but instead of taking that with both hands and... Running into September with a bit of momentum, they've proven themselves to be the laughing stock of the competition once again. <laughs> and that is my, I'm hesitant, I'm hesitant to say, beloved Carlton Football Club because they're doing nothing but causing me hatred in my bones <laughs> at the moment. But yes, they uh, had the opportunity to make a stake for finals against North Melbourne and got absolutely creamed. And then they had the same opportunity at the Gold Coast and once again got absolutely creamed. Before I start ranting and raving more than I already am, Dossie, you watched the game. What did you think of it? Uh, just almost typical, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. It's it sort of the whole build-up to the week, uh, the opportunity that was laid in front of them as we sort of broke down the Bradby, Bradbury plan for the Blues was that, uh, you know, if results went their way, and results is in the bookies' favourites, the Blues could be either ninth or eighth by the end of the round. The only asterisk on that was they just got to get over Gold Coast. And as we know, going into the, the contest, um, it, it, it should happen, but will it? And I felt like the Carlton of old and the Carlton that pops up every now and again, that immaturity to um, take on the pressure, take on the expectation, win the games they should, bobbed up and it's just it shows a, a real immature immaturity throughout the group I feel that will come in time it'll take you know a season or two but those games will start 
getting put away from this Carlton outfit. Um, and yeah, took Miller once again, a, a great performance. He's putting together a superb season and the Gold Coast Suns are finally starting to nab a couple of late season wins, which is what they were desperate for. They've had a rancid sort of form post the bye in the last couple of years. So, um, to get a win in Melbourne again was a great result, but how are you feeling after it all, Rog? Uh, well, you do say immaturity, and I hundred percent get where you're coming from. And I told, I sort of spoke this point to you straight after the game, where you know I think immaturity would be if you know we needed to beat a good, decent top eight side, say a West Coast. Um, you know they're in the top eight. Just say we played West Coast in the last round and we we're up by three goals at three quarter time, and we just needed to hang on to make finals, and we shit the bed. We couldn't deal with the weight of expectation and we conceded four goals on the trot and we lose. That's when I start going, yeah, that's a bit of inexperience. Can't cope with the pressure, but um, give it another year, you know, and we'll be better off for it. Um, But I don't think this is in sort of a similar realm. This is Gold Coast, you know, a team that was absolutely embarrassed and annihilated the week before um, by your mob, the Demons. And uh, we're coming off a ripping win. We're playing them at home. There is just no reason why we should be beaten. And it wasn't like Gold Coast played out of their skin and um, we played well, but, you know, the better team won on the day. It was like we one of those games where it felt like we didn't really turn up. The energy wasn't there. And I've sort of – I've maintained that Tiggy – while I'm not the massive greatest Teague fan where I would think, yes, he's an ex-premiership coach, I do think second a coach after two or three – two and a half years – Probably isn't right. I think mm. you need to give someone enough time to really implement their game plan and then change their game plan because what are the odds a coach strolls in and their first game plan is a premiership winning game plan? It's unlikely. It's going to need tweaks. It's going to need changes. And then eventually, you know, we're there. So I like giving them, you know, that four or five years. But um, the fact that he couldn't get the players motivated for a must win finals game against North Melbourne and couldn't get them motivated for a must win game against the Gold Coast and both of those games fell in. Side uh, the proximity of this uh, external review, and ma- and all the conversation. If you listen to your footy classifiers and whatnot, is that he's pretty much gone, um, and that decision will be announced in the coming week. So I think it's a necessary change, just because um, forgetting about skill and pressure and whatnot. If you can't get the boys up and about, which is the coach's main job, if you can't get them motivated for a Gold Coast and a North Melbourne must win finals game, then. Something does need to change, unfortunately. So I feel sorry for Teague in one respect. I don't think he's had enough time. But, um, you know, we've got so many players coming into their prime now. I think that we haven't got much time to waste. So if, especially if Clarko's gettable, and I think it will be Clarko, welcome aboard. And that is, <laughs> the start, that is the start of hopefully after 23 years of waiting, hopefully the start of our premiership tilt. That would be the biggest story in football. I'm pretty sure, yeah, Took Miller, I, I think, had a, an absolute blinder. But also Will Powell had probably one of his best performances uh, in defence. Another young player uh, up and coming. Oh, I just have a quick question for you on Matty Rowell. I, I didn't quite see how he went on the weekend in terms of stats, but he hasn't come back the player that he was at the start of his first year. He's obviously had an injury injury interrupted year and he's 19 20 so it's hard to jump on him but um you'd hope after another pre-season he could come back and sort of show that form that he showed in early 2020 because that was amazing the way he was going about it but how do you see him tracking recently well i think it's an interesting one because obviously when he did get suspended he was the brownlow favorite um not the favorite but he was leading the brownlow at that stage um, and he's come back, and I think everyone understood he's not going to come back in that sort of form and light the competition on fire, although we were hoping he would do that. But it's not just um, – it's not like he hasn't reached those heights. It's, mm. He has been um, – you know, if he if his name wasn't Matt Real, if his name was Trent Bianco, he'd be omitted. Um, yeah. So they're persisting with him, which I like, but – he, I watched him closely on the weekend. We were look, checking up his stats every few minutes, me and Dad, just because we were interested to see how he's going. And, yeah, he just 
he just wasn't having an impact on the game at all. And when he did have the pill in hand, he didn't look dangerous. He didn't look powerful. I don't know if he's just completely devoid of confidence, you know, and mm. give him time when he gets back, he'll be the beast he once was. But yeah, I think um, instead of the conversation being around Matty Rowell, I think it should be more on players like Noah Anderson, who continues to just rack up pill. And Noah Anderson, I think, is flying under the radar. I think... Um, he isn't getting anywhere near the amount of conversation he deserves because week after week he just keeps on playing good footy. Mm. And just on Took Miller quickly, I think if I could handpick any two players to come to the Blue Baggers um, and help our premiership tilt next year, I'd be picking Took Miller and I'd be picking Toby Green. I think they'd be my two two selections. Uh, both superstars work hard mm. and body on the line stuff. So I love both of them. But enough about my pathetic rabble. I'm sick of talking about them. Move on to the team that is on top of the table. Can you smell the premiership in the air? I certainly can. Of course, it's the Melbourne Demons. Just getting the job done professionally over West Coast last night in the thunderstorm. First time I think I've ever seen a thunderstorm delay. (laughs) Uh, But that didn't stop them. A nice little nine-point win against a, a West Coast who... Good for them. They decided to turn up this week. How gallant. <laughs> That's nice of them. Um, you'd be wrapped, mate. Are you starting to really, really dare to believe? Yeah, I am starting to dare to believe, to be honest. Uh, that was an amazing performance. The week in quarantine, the, the obviously the, the travel, the plane ride before the Gold Coast game, and then some of the players didn't go home. They had to stay in the hotel um, before they went to Queensland because uh, to get into Queensland, you needed to have a 60-hour bubble. So some players were in a hotel from like Thursday night onwards and then flew up to Queensland to play Gold Coast and then obviously there was cases so they came back down, went back to the hotel um, and then went over to Perth to do quarantine. So uh, they've been put through the ringer a little bit and every club has to go through patches and stages and obviously it's uh, nothing comparing to the uh, GWS and the Sydney boys, the the amount of time they've been on the road, but a little bit of adversity for the young Ds and um, for them to go over and especially in that third quarter, I felt like that second quarter we were up against the 18, (laughs) the 2018 West Coast Eagles. I had a feeling after um, the way the media sort of jumped on them during the week that they would be back to their best and they put it all on the line. Um, the effort and intensity was what we'd expect from the West Coast Eagles week in, week out. But it was amazing that the Melbourne Footy Club could just get it done. And to be up by 32 points uh, with 15 minutes left of the last, I was really, really stoked. And then all of a sudden the lightning hits, everyone goes off the ground, and then uh, West Coast come out and they just stole all of the momentum. They came home with the wettest of sails. And, um, the, yeah, the margin didn't look as comprehensive as what the game probably was. It was a nice little 10-minute patch for the Eagles to try and get back in it. But another great victory. And I can't believe after everyone else had stumbling uh, blocks over the weekend, the Western Bulldogs, the Geelong Cats, uh, the Ds have gone back to first. I thought for sure we were sort of going to at least finish second or third, maybe. I, I, I thought I was sort of coming to terms with third. Um coming into late in the season and we we still could finish there but uh, yeah to go back up to first with two rounds to go is just a sight for sore eyes <laughs> well i uh i was saying that i think melbourne proved throughout the year by beating the best teams consistently that they are the best team they did have the occasional hiccup against the bottom eight teams but then over the last few weeks um you started to have a little bit of a lull like there were question marks coming up but i just thought that's the lull before your eventual storm back into finals there's no uh into finals form there's no way that um your first half of the season beating all the top sides was just luck or something of the something of the like, a, a red hot patch. That was true form. And then we saw the lull, which happens to most teams throughout every season. And now you're back and you've come good at the right time. And uh, I hit a nice little quaddy to a nice little bank builder on Saturday. Um, I only returned uh, $250, but uh, as you well know, I've had that, and get more responsibility, kids. I had that all on the demons, paying $5.50 for the flag. And they're into $4 now. So, um, look, they're paying 
saying uh, I'll get a nice little fifteen hundred dollar return when you win uh, the big <laughs> dance, and it's something I'm really excited for for you, mate. I'm going to be I'm on a footy trip with all the Banyul boys, hopefully lockdown provided in Echuca over that weekend. So I'll be in an Echuca pub, absolutely <laughs> going bananas when the demons are in the big dance. And I hope I hope you're thinking about it every minute of every day because I know I certainly would be. And um, it's not something that comes around often. Top of the table premiership favoritism. So. Uh, soak it in, Dossy, and enjoy every minute. Well, yeah, it is. Um, it's super exciting, and it, it's uh, there's, there's a little bit of sadness in terms of we're one win away from our most successful season ever um, as a footy club, and it's just a little bit of sadness creeps in when you know for years I've been going to 12, 13, 14 games a season um, and seeing two or three wins, and <laughs> it, it sucks that I can't quite be a part of it as much as what I would want to be. Um, supporting the boys, but I'm hoping that when finals hits, um, yeah, yeah, how's the anxiety for the for the big dance? A hundred, <laughs> you know. Well, mate, when you mention, I haven't thought about it in that context, but it seems like almost a zero percent possibility you have a hundred k at the G. You know, d- yeah, you'll still have the time of your life if it's seventy thousand and you're there in Melbourne win the grand final. Don't get me wrong, but yep. it does <laughs> sort of suck a bit of energy out of me knowing that it won't be a pack sold out MCG for you. Yeah, well, it yeah, it just sucks because since round nine, I've been to three games, um, and yep. I, I'm usually going to the G every week. So, um, it it it, it is the most successful demon season ever up into this point but obviously there's still a little bit to go i just want to give a quick shout out i think luke jackson almost nudged his nose in front of the rising star race last night with another great performance he was uh very very handy when he went into the ruck against nick nat um both great at that follow-up uh ruck work and he was holding his own with the uh, the hit outs as well and then some of his marking around the ground in the wet was superb um, and Jake Bowie, we found another one, the D's. He is an amazing uh, small defender. He plays a little bit taller than what he is. His composure is second to none. He did get absolutely decked late in the game when the <laughs> going was tough. But, um, yeah, his composure with footy in hand, especially around the absolute furnace of uh, opposition defences or opposition forward lines, um, he's, he's one that could be really handy going in late into the season. So a pretty professional performance um, sees the D's Go back to the top of the ladder. But, Rog, a little bit of a disappointing, well, absolutely disgraceful sort of news story that came out during the week. A bit of a head-scratcher news story as well, um, con- uh, yeah, considering the people involved and how it all sort of came out. But uh, Taylor Walker has been caught up in a bit of a racist situation. Um and it's been very confusing for everyone in the footy sort of landscape because no one's really sure why it's happened and when when it's happened and what's been said. But Taylor Walker has been suspended for six matches. He won't play the rest of the season and he'll miss three games next year. Um, he's taking a bit of leave away from the footy club and it's all come from an incident in the Sandful game. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, it's honestly gob- gobsmacked me. It's very, it's just hard to fathom um, the stupidity of it. And all the uh, experts who are far more qualified to speak on this sort of stuff, you know, Indigenous commentators and whatnot have said their peeps. And I, if you want a real opinion on, on this matter, you're better off listening to them. But I'm more gobsmacked at just the stupidity Um more than the racism. Like, I know that I, I hate racism as much as everybody and we want to stamp that out. Um, it's just amazing to me that he could be so stupid to say a, a racist comment out loud when he's a former captain of the Adelaide Football Club as high a profile as anyone could possibly have in Adelaide. Mm. And at the local footy, he said something r- overtly racist. And no one, not, not many people anyway, know exactly what he said. All I know is that on... Uh, the Sunday footy show um, in response to Mark Rusciuto's comments where he called it casual racism or alluded to casual racism. And Kane Corns and uh, TJ uh, came out and said there was nothing casual about this. This was uh, the worst of the worst. This was as, as, as overtly racist as it gets. So how that could come to his head. And now there's no excuse for racism whatsoever. Uh, there's no time where it's okay. But if you're in the heat of battle, you're playing a game of footy, um, and uh, a person of colour does something you deem to be a dog act, and when your adrenaline's going, 
the the worst possible version of you, your subconscious comes to the floor and you in pure aggression, you let out something you definitely shouldn't say. There is no excuse for that. Everyone should know better and you should not do that. But at least a part of me then would go would understand where his head was at when he said it. I would not, wouldn't agree with it, wouldn't condone it, but I'd understand where his head was at. But in this instance where there was nothing of that sort, he was just walking around. I've seen the vision. He was walking around. There was no real altercation. And he's just said out loud the worst of the worst you can say in racism. That's not a subconscious, emotional, aggressive act that uh, the worst version of him has produced. That seems like just Taylor Walker as he is consciously saying something that is overtly racism. So there are no more educated people about the indigenous on the Indigenous community than AFL players. He's captained the most loved Indigenous player of all time, just about, Eddie Betts. And uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And some people are taking the stance, you know, they understand what he said was wrong, but now they're in a bit of a, we need to nurture text. He's done the crime and now he's serving the time. Um, but I sort of think that it's a bit quick to move on just just yet the implications of this is massive and um i just am so confused by the whole thing dossie yeah i think everyone's in a similar boat it's a a a real head scratcher Uh, especially because like we we were sort of trying to trying to work out like there's not much you can say that isn't sackable really like i can't think of many things that he would have said that warrant six weeks but doesn't warrant a sacking like i and I don't want to see Tex Walker go out that way. So I, I do like the, I like going down the path of the education and whatnot. I do think that that's a pretty valuable way to go down. Um, it just feels a little bit light on the games, sort of missed, but just a real unnecessary, bizarre situation. Yeah. Well, the I understand the educational. Route, and I think that does make a lot of sense for most people. Um, when a fan says it at a game and they call them out and, yeah, 100%, let's educate them, um, let's broaden the footy community's horizons to all of this. But when it's the captain of the Adelaide Football Club who has had so many brilliant Indigenous players and had brilliant Indigenous players leave as an account of that fa- infamous camp where apparently the Indigenous players were, uh, weren't treated as they should have been... Um, he, there would be literally, not literally, but may as well have been no more educated people on uh, on Indigenous um, beliefs and where they stand in there and uh, how they should be treated than Taylor Walker. He is in seat A1 when it comes to that sort of stuff. So for yep. him to come out and say it. And the other issue, the reason why I think it is so um, abhorrent is because when a family is over the fence at a game and says something overtly racist to a player. Everyone puts their hands up and says, we are not a racist country. He is just a racist person. Um, we, he does not speak for us. It is only the bottom 1%. Um, and, that, and, then, and the Indigenous people, uh, I believe, are subconscious and they think that, no, I don't think it's just him. I think everyone's thinking similar things behind closed doors. Mm. So when Taylor Walker comes out and he thinks no one's listening, he thinks he's just talking to his mate or whatever the go was, and he says something overtly racist, the one person the captain of an AFL football club where Indigenous issues happen, when he is the one coming out and saying it, then of course the Indigenous people are going to think, if he's saying it, the most one, a man who could not be any more educated on the subject matter, then I can be pretty well assured that a lot of the country behind closed doors are saying similar things. So that's why I think it, it is so bad. And um, yeah, I don't think we should be... I think we need to nurture text, but I think that shouldn't be the dialogue just yet. I think we need to really put more of a focus on how bad it was what he did. Yeah, beautifully said, Rog. I couldn't have put it any better. Now, uh, obviously, Texas team played off in the showdown, and it was a great contest. It was honestly, I felt like Adelaide had uh, port on the ropes for most of the game, and I felt like Adelaide probably deserved to win. Uh, but the power they rose very, very late and got the job done. Um, and they still solidify that top four spot. They actually jumped into third, which was outrageous. Uh, <laughs> uh, they keep on keeping on. I, it just I still just don't see them as that top four team. It doesn't feel like they're building towards anything. I know that they're technically building because they're starting to put together a good run of form and a good run of games, but it doesn't... I don't know. I don't feel the threat just yet. <laughs> nah, not one bit of me thinks, Jay, <laughs> if they put together a big four games, you know, they could... 
they could do damage in the grand final. And that's not something you usually say about no. a top four team. Usually it's like six to eighth where you're like, um, you know what? I reckon if Sydney put together a big four weeks, they, they could maybe pull off a massive upset. Usually with the top four, it's any of them are credentialed enough to, to make the grand final. Um, but I'll be shocked if Port Adelaide are in the big dance. Mm. I just don't. I just don't see that happening. But hopefully they prove me wrong. I think it'd be pretty cool to see them in the grand final. Um, watching him up close, I've started to pay a lot more attention to him um, just because he's in Brownlow contention. And I'll, don't get me wrong, I've known he's a good footballer for a long time. But watching Ollie Wines up close, he's just that. How good are Bulls? I think. <laughs> I think. Bulls uh, uh, is have really come in the last five years, yeah. and there are really none as bullish as uh, Ollie Wines. He's just a contested ball king, and he stands up in big moments. Kicked one goal three, so it could have been one of the all-time games. But, yeah, uh, if it wasn't for Bontempelli being the runaway leader, I think Wines would be right there or thereabouts for that Brownlow medal. Yeah, no, nah, he's, um, he's just so physical, so big, and he had an amazing explosive start to his career. He was, like, Port's best player in his first couple of years and then didn't drop off, but... Uh, I don't know whether it was injuries or whatnot, but he just wasn't that player for a good three or four, five years. He almost went missing for a little bit, but he's come back and he's well and truly fulfilling his potential, uh, which is unbelievable. And Alir Alir, who won the showdown medal, was absolutely awesome. Just the intercept marking and uh, the way that he went about it was superb. And every time Adelaide went forward, especially late, you're going, geez, I think there are a chance that, you know, pinched this one because they were winning the whole game and then they lost the lead and then uh, in the last couple of minutes it was going forward and every time Ali Ali was marking as if he was the key forward so he's pretty much got them over the line and Ryan Burton down back that is, I know they got Burton I don't think it was last season it was the year before but Ali Ali and Burton are just two unbelievably good additions to that back line and um, if they do manage to surprise a few people including myself in September I think it will be on the back of uh, your Ali Ali standing up and being those rocket Gibraltars down back that um, don't allow the opposition to kick a bigger score than them but Adelaide I think they um, you know going into the season people said that they are going to be the worst Adelaide outfit we've ever seen um, it was very pessimistic about them. Um, and I think that they've done okay. You know, like they haven't shocked the world. Um, they are still second bottom on the ladder. But I think that they haven't... It could have gone a lot worse for them. Um, and I'm hopeful that they are they are on the up. And yeah, Port Adelaide, get the chocolates in Showdown 50. It's a shame they couldn't have had 50,000 people there for it. We know how unbelievable the showdown is with a packed crowd. But, look, they're in the top four. You can't ask for much more. They get that double chance, and who knows, maybe they could surprise in September. And, um, yeah, the the last sort of shout-out I want to give to a Port Adelaide player, um, I, I sort of tweeted last night in the midst of four or five beers and uh, a little bit of adrenaline and excitement post-stream. I said, geez, Jake Bowie could be a rising star nom. And um, I had about 50 comments saying Miles Bergman absolutely has to sign up this week. He had 23 touches in the showdown and was enormous. So a little shout-out to Miles Bergman. Who <laughs> Eddie been- Maguire <laughs> loves Miles Bergman. Did you watch the week before? <laughs> no. Every time Bergman touched the ball, Eddie Maguire... Bergman again! <laughs> it, was, it was so funny. Dad and I couldn't fathom how much he loved Miles Bergman. Well, yeah, he's he's building quite nicely as well. So they, they, they seem to draft well, uh, Port Adelaide, in the last couple of years. Absolutely. There, now, there were a run of games on the weekend that just made tipping absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> I've had a one-point tip uh, one point lead in the tipping for a little while, and now I'm level. Someone's pegged me back, and it's Vivian Nguyen, a lady who is wow. very new, a woman who's very, very new to football, um, but loves it. Watches every game every week. I can't believe how much this little Vietnamese lass, lass has fallen in love with the game of football. <laughs> um, but you know, it always it's always a typical gag that it's the people that have no idea that win the tipping, and no season. Ever has that been more true than now when, I'm not saying I have no idea, but I'm saying absolutely anyone is winning on any given Sunday. Mm. And uh, it was proven again with St Kilda upsetting the Swans, Hawks upsetting the Pies, Essendon upsetting the Dogs, Giants upsetting the Cats. What the bloody hell is happening this (laughs) season, McDonald? It is crazy. Well, they talk about equalisation a lot in the AFL and how, you know, the fixture is uh, staggered, so the bottom... 
six sides get to play the bottom six sides over and over and they don't play the top six sides more than once. And it is all just just coming together quite beautifully for the AFL where that is the case. Like, I can't remember many seasons. Like, when I was growing up, the Geelong, the Hawthorne days, the person who finished top of the ladder would drop one or two and the person who finished bottom of the ladder would win one or two and that was it. But now it's like the person finishing last is winning four or five and probably should have pinched a sixth or a seventh and the person who finishes first uh, um, dropping four or five, like they're they're definitely gettable. And, and back in the day, like the top four was never gettable. The top four would just run rampant over teams below them. So I just can't believe, yeah, how even it is and um, – it is just amazing to watch. And that's why, like, especially uh, supporting a side that's up the top of the ladder, I don't trust the Ds going into any game because we've seen the Hawks rock up and pinch a draw. We've seen the Giants who were playing awful footy. They lost to, well, they drew with North Melbourne, lost to the Hawks weeks prior, came and knocked us off. So it is amazing to watch footy at the moment. And it's, yeah, as you said, it's horrible for the tippers. Clarko continually continuing to just stick the big middle finger up to the Hawthorne board that have sacked him. <laughs> they were, you know, once again, they were like paying two dollars fifty going into that game or something. Majority of people tip the pies, and the Hawks have just absolutely creamed them. And I'm starting to, when I, you know, I'm not totally convinced yet, but I'm starting to see some of their young plays, and I'm starting to believe in a bit of a future. Whereas I wasn't like that before. I was a bit pessimistic about their young talent, but I don't know whether it's just a Clarko effect, and he's on the way out, and they want to do him justice and proud. But they've strung together a nice little month of footy, and I think that uh, they'll be held in good stead for the next couple of years, providing Sam Mitchell can coach. But I think they would have been held in a little <laughs> bit better stead if Clarko was still at the helm. Um, but the big upset that I think we need to focus uh, our attention on most, apologies to St Kilda fans upsetting the Swans because that was a great win, uh, is Essendon upsetting the Doggies. Did you watch all of this game? I certainly did and I was enthralled by it. I love watching the Bombers and I thought I'd never say that as a Carlton supporter. <laughs> I watched, uh, yes, from the first bounce to the to the last sire and it was a great game of footy. Um, being a D's, you know, being a D's fan, have to crowbar the D's in. I was watching with one eye on the Bulldogs going, if they somehow drop this, it could open up the door for the D's. So I was sort of subtly going for Essendon and, um, I wouldn't say that they're my least favourite team, but I wouldn't say that they're my favourite team. They are my least favourite team. (laughs) I hate, I hate them so much. (laughs) I wouldn't say they're my favourite team by any stretch, but I was getting very excited the more that they started to get on top and, I was waiting for the Bulldogs' comeback. I was waiting for that Bulldogs' barnstorm home, and it just never came. They never really fired a shot. And bloody two-metre Peter just said, I am Wayne Carey. I can do what I want. And <laughs> oh, seven, seven-seater Peter, they're calling him now, after his seven-goal display. <laughs> he just took the game by the scruff of the neck. And, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the Bombers have been close with a lot of top-eight teams this year. They've been knocking the door down... Um, with upset wins. I'm pretty sure, yeah, they knocked off West Coast. And th- there's been a couple of other results where they've been really, really close in knocking off um, some of the best in the business. And they got another genuine scalp uh, on the weekend. And it's probably their best win for the year. Well, they've got it would be, and it was one of the wins of the year from any team. And they've got Gold Coast next week. And then they've got Collingwood the week after that. So it'll be, it should be Essendon v Pies to get Essendon a spot in the eight in the last round um, is what I tip to be the scenario, which will be absolutely enthralling viewing. It'll be a final before the final series has even begun. Um, and I just love what they're building. Like Jake Stringer has proven me wrong. You know, we always know that he had the ability, but I just didn't see him being able to string it together consistently over a season. But I think he'd probably be leading their best and fairest this year, mate. Oh, well, Darcy Parrish probably. Um, but, yeah, he, he continues to have a massive impact. And if they do make finals, you know, we've seen him do it before for the Doggies, mm-hmm. um, he will be a massive player in that game. It only takes in finals all of your players to play um, at the best of their ability and one star to shine above the rest and you've got a winning formula for a, grand, for a, for a finals win. So I think Stringer could be that player that sets – 
Essendon apart from other teams um, if they do happen to make the finals. So I'm a bit bullish about the Dons. I think if they do make finals, they could win one or two and do a bit of damage. I really like what they're building there, and it breaks my heart. Going into this season, if you told me <laughs> Essendon would be making finals and Carlton would be languishing down at uh, 13th, I would be uh, I would have hit you. I would have absolutely <laughs> swung one in your direction. Uh, but here we are, and weirdly, I'm happy for them because everyone wrote them off, and I love when people write people off and they prove you're wrong. So good on you, Essendon uh, Football Club. Could do anything. Yeah, well, they, they've sort of just sat um, mid-tier for a long time, and I have been proved wrong in terms of I've saw them sitting mid-tier for four or five years and went, well, you've lost some key players. You can't be better than last year. Um but just that injection of youth and the players that have come in, they've improved. So fair play to the Essendon Footy Club and um, some exciting times ahead for sure. But should we move on to the number one segment on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast? Absolutely, the GBOs. And just quickly, one last thing on SNM. We need to tip our hat to Ben Rutten. I think we're so quick to, um, you know, oust coaches like your Stewie Jews and your Brett Rattens and your David Teagues when they're not going well. And we're not quick enough to congratulate coaches. Uh, when we're not quick enough to congratulate coaches when they are doing well. And SNM, everyone had them written off. Bottom four, here they are contending and probably will make the eight. So Ben Rutten, I, I didn't think you could coach, to be honest. But here you are, the <laughs> truck, you got him in the eight. Well done. Um, out in the fall for mine, McDonald, is the Gold Coast Suns. Not because they've beaten my baggers, but because the way they got rid of Jared Lyons and now Peter Wright for a packet of twisties and a <laughs> can of Coke, it is bizarre stuff. Peter Wright playing Nefal last year, um, two metres can kick 55 metres gun barrel straight uh, and they've let him go for a fourth round pick. What the bloody hell is happening there? Yeah, well, in the preseason, he was someone that I thought the D's could acquire. Um, a ready-made tall player. And in his draft year, he was very, very highly touted and he went missing up at the Gold Coast Suns. Why couldn't he get a game? Was it Sam Day and Ben King probably squeezed him out? I still feel like, the two metre probably should have got a bit of a look in. But, uh, yeah, when he went to Essendon, I thought that is a terrific pickup. He is a ready-made, genuine key forward that can play. It doesn't get much better than that. And he slotted in nicely. And his goal-kicking action is probably the best of all the young forwards. I think he's now pushing your 23, 24-year-old age. So he's not quite your Max Kings and uh, Georgiatis type age. So he is maturing quite nicely. But, yeah, his uh, set shot kicking is a thing of beauty. And he was just spanking them from uh, from all sorts. Gun, barrel, straight. What's your out in the full? My out on the full is uh, just sort of on the theme of the racism and, and stamping it out. There was some more comments over the weekend on social media about Aaliyah Aaliyah when he won the showdown medal. And I'm sort of torn between... The, the, we are calling out the statement, uh, the, the comments every time. And, and there's like a club statement, an AFL statement, every time there is racist comments. And a part of me goes, that's bloody brilliant because that'll you know, sh- show some light on the individuals that are doing it and people will know that if you're going to be an idiot on social media, there is accountability. So I do like that aspect. But then I start to think, are we giving too much airtime to oxygen thieves? And are we are we giving them the oxygen that they are after? Like them getting their little shout out and them getting a statement on the Port Adelaide website and, and whatnot. Is that what they're after? So, you know, I don't know the solution. I feel like, yeah, calling it out is probably the best thing to do because it, it isn't um, hiding away from the fact and it is wrapping the arms around, you know, the victims of these, these racism comments. But I do, yeah, think that some of these trolls are getting a bit too much airtime for mine as well. Yeah, it's like they're getting what they're what they're after. But I think yeah. the only um, the only way for it to be stamped out, you know, completely online, and this is uh, this is bigger fish to fry than what the back pocket plugger kitchen <laughs> is capable of doing. So, but it's for the social media companies to people are campaigning for this. They have to hold people more accountable, or laws have to come in from the government. Where because if I racially abuse someone on the street. Um, I will get in big trouble with it by the police. I'll get fined and whatnot. Mm. Um, it should be the same, no different for social media. If you're a count and you're a real person and you come out and you racially abuse someone, you should be at the behest of the law as well. Of course. My behind is the Geelong Football Club. Uh, 
the, like we've said it a couple of times throughout the year, when they lose, everyone goes, oh, they're too old, they're too slow. And when they win, they we say they're experienced and that'll hold them <laughs> in good stead for finals. But once again, this is a loss where this, you know, their kick mark game style, when it gets a bit exposed, it does... It does raise a few questions, raise a few eyebrows, and I've I've had a lot more question marks over Geelong this year as I ha- uh, than I have Melbourne, and then I have the Bulldogs. So I have Melbourne leading my power rankings, and I, then I had Geelong, and then I had the Bulldogs, but now I actually have the Bulldogs into second despite their loss against the Bombers, and Geelong into the third because I think in finals when it's just run and gun, all guns blazing, I think Geelong might uh, might be susceptible to getting a bit exposed. So. Geelong, you're still top three, so it's not an out in the full, but you are my behind because I think you are vulnerable. My uh, my behind, Rog, is Daniel Gorringe on the weekend. Did oh, you no, see this? He, <laughs> he went an outrageous call, and um, usually when you do a big call, you've got to put your money where your mouth is, unfortunately, for Daniel. So before the Gold Coast and Carlton game, he said, if Gold Coast beat Carlton, I will get a <laughs> tattooed picture of Stewie Jew <laughs> on my body. I and, did see this actually, and obviously the Suns got over the line, and I, I feel bad for him in a way because he's obviously just taken the piss on Twitter. But seven AFL grabbed a hold of it and plastered it before the game. Sportsbet plastered it. I, uh, you know, it just went absolutely wild to a point where just a silly tweet uh, that got put up ended up being sort of everywhere before the game started. And mm, for mine, that's not just a silly tweet. If you are willing to get all. <laughs> All of the attention and all of the publicity that comes from saying such an outlandish statement, you've got to be willing to pay the price when said outlandish statement does not fall your way. Well, he is willing to pay the price because he said he will get a tat once lockdown has ended. So, Daniel Gorringe, fair play. He said he's going to get a Stuart Drew tat. Um, because, yeah, the Blues couldn't get over the line. That is just, that is a bit of an odd Saturday. I don't think you would have expected that to happen on his Saturday, no, have Absolutely. But then again, you know, the price is, you know, a small little chunk of his body and he's got all eyes on him once again. So, uh, you know, I think he's be pretty happy with the situation, the amount of eyes he's got on him. Um, my goal is the Adelaide trainer, I believe it was a Sandful trainer, who called out, uh, Taylor Walker's comments, I think um, to do it to someone that's in your own sort of team, you know, in your own club, uh, would be very difficult, take a lot of courage, you'd be scared that um, it could backfire on you and people could turn on you for ousting the former captain and club legend, but um, thankfully that hasn't seemingly happened and everyone's in full support of the person, I don't know if the person was Indigenous or not. But, um, yeah, I think that that's what we want to see more of. And the sort of people that call out racism once upon a time we've seen as sooks and whinges. Mm. And now, rightfully so, we're congratulating them on the courage that they have to, to not cop it anymore. So good on you, Adelaide trainer, whoever you may be. Yeah, well said, Rog. And to wrap up the show, my goal, we spoke about it just before, but Essendon's win, uh, obviously watching that on Sunday, I got absolutely invested. I got sucked right in and it was a real professional performance by the Young Bombers. And uh, yeah, as we said before, I think he was in your... uh, sort of your out on the full in terms of the Gold Coast. Uh, He's in my goals in terms of the two-metre, Peter. It was an amazing performance, kicking them from everywhere. His hands were awesome. And, uh, yeah, probably his best, well, absolutely his best performance in an AFL game. Rog, I think that's us done. Absolutely, McDonald. Uh, Thank you so much for the show once again, and thank you all, uh, footy public, for listening. It means Thanks to yeah, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk some more footy. Until then, uh, keep up the back pocket plug pluggery. No, oh, you've you've stolen me line. Keep plugging those back pockets. <laughs>